In this lecture, we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, with the, uh, what I think we will see is very important calling of Levi to be one of Jesus' disciples. Those verses say this. He, referring to Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, in this scene, it again begins with Jesus' teaching. Remember, Jesus had said uh, in Mark uh, 2, verse 2, uh, I believe it was, or uh, in, in Mark 1, that he had to go to the other towns and villages to preach and teach. Um, and now, as is, was true with the healing of the paralyzed man in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, this episode with uh, the calling of Levi uh, is important and reveals much uh, about the nature of God and the gospel. There are really four areas uh, of which this uh, episode is significant. Uh, first, the nature of Jesus, the kingdom and the gospel. Secondly, our need for God's grace and forgiveness. Third, the profound nature of truly being born again, and that is demonstrated well by Levi. Uh, and fourth, the nature of Jesus's opponents. Now, so first, let's take a look at the nature of Jesus, the kingdom, and the gospel. Now, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, the healing of the paralyzed man, that spoke directly to the issue of who Jesus is. Remember, he said, your sins are forgiven just by his word. He called himself the Son of Man. And as the scribes recognize, only God can do that. So verses 1 through 12 went directly to the issue of who Jesus is. But this section tells us about the nature of the gospel, the kingdom, Jesus' values, and his relationship with people. Michael Spencer puts it this way. He says, If Christianity is correct in its confession that Jesus is the incarnation of the eternal creator God, then Jesus' treatment of individuals is perhaps the most important part of the gospel me message. Why is that? because this indicates how God feels about me. It is the most personal aspect of what the Gospels have to say to any of us. And we need to look at this um, because in the first century, Jesus' calling of Levi, it's particularly significant because in the first century, tax collectors were especially despised. And this was for a number of reasons. You see, the Romans sold tax-collecting franchises to the highest bidder. And once the tax collector paid his quota to the Romans, he could keep everything else. And as a result, most tax collectors were notoriously dishonest and sometimes collected double or more of what was really owed. Also, tax collectors were seen as being collaborators with the foreign occupying force, namely the Romans. Um, and so most Jews hated the tax collectors, um, and so tax collectors basically were considered ritually unclean, uh, and they were numbered with the non-religious outcasts of society. Um, and so it's no surprise that tax collectors were associated with prostitutes and other irreligious, quote, sinners, end quote. Um, now, this passage demonstrates uh, that Jesus uh, d does not play favorites. Um, 
Now, God's grace is not limited to the rich, the powerful, the wealthy, or the educated. Although some of these, like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, were his followers. But God's grace is extended to everyone, people of all kinds without distinction, women as well as men, the young and the old, poor and the rich, the weak and the strong, the uneducated and the educated, the sick as well as the well, the ugly and the good-looking, the unlovable as well as the lovable, even tax collectors and sinners. Um, and so this is demonstrated particularly when it says in verse 15 that Jesus reclined at table in Levi's house. And by the way, Levi uh, is also known as uh, Matthew. Matthew and Levi are the same person. Uh, Walter Wessel says that Levi was probably uh, his given name, and Matthew, which means gift of God, his apostolic name. So, but here in Mark, he's called Levi. And Jesus reclined at table with him. In other words, he ate with him. Uh, and that is particularly significant uh, for at least two reasons. In that, particularly in that culture, sharing a meal was the deepest sign of hospitality and acceptance. It was an invitation to friendship and fellowship, going beyond simply sharing of food. Um, and so many scholars point out that Jesus was doing this intentionally and in a very public way to proclaim the radically different message about the kingdom of God and the God of the kingdom that Jesus was representing. Um, and so, you see, Jesus was not just extending a super, superficial grace to tax collectors and sinners, uh, but keeping his distance from them. No, just as he embraced or touched the leper, uh, rather than just healing him uh, at a distance, Jesus was demonstrating real friendship, deep relationship, and true acceptance of people who were shunned by the, quote, respectable, end quote, people of society. Now, this tells us much about the nature of the kingdom and the gospel, and it's a lesson we all need to learn. Peter had to learn that lesson. Remember, back in Acts chapter 10, Peter had been shown in when the, he had the vision of the animals uh, including ritually unclean animals, being lowered in the sheet. And God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever passed my lips. And God said, how dare you call unclean what I call clean? And then the representatives from Cornelius, uh, the Gentiles' house, came, and Peter went and preached the gospel, and the Holy Spirit fell on uh, Cornelius and his household. Well, Peter had learned that lesson but it never really sunk in. And we know that from Galatians chapter 2, uh, because in Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14, it says, When Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when he came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas got carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? What Paul is saying is that the gospel affects everything about our lives. Uh, including who we eat with. Um, and so, as a matter of fact, the New uh, International Version, uh, here I'm, I was quoting the English Standard Version, which says, I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. The NIV translate as that as saying, he, they are not in line with the truth of the gospel. Um, and so the gospel affects everything. It affects our relationship with people. And of all kinds of people, including, or I might say, especially those who are different from us. That is what Jesus was demonstrating by calling Levi and then 
eating with him at his house. Now, these lessons of Mark 2 and Galatians 2 are profoundly important for the church today because the issue may not be who we eat with, but the same type of thing occurs anytime a church or an individual Christian deny people membership, positions of leadership, fellowship, authority, or full equality because they're part of the wrong tribe or they're of a different ethnic background or a different socioeconomic background or other similar external reasons. Um, Peter was a hypocrite uh, because although he believed in Christ and so on and, and God had given him a vision to show him this, he was in, he put the, uh, the opinion of people the Judaizers, over the truth of the gospel. And so he had basically turned his Jewish heritage into an idol. The gospel is the truth, and the truth necessarily affects how we live our lives. And if we need to resolutely examine ourselves and change those practices to bring our lives, our practices uh, into line with the implications of the gospel. That's what Jesus was demonstrating when he was eating with Levi. But there's a second reason why uh, this is important. Because just as Jesus for, uh, forgave the paralyzed man, and that pointed to the fact that Jesus himself would bear that man's sins on the cross. So, uh, the meal that Jesus had with Levi and his friends pointed to what's called the Messianic Banquet, or the Wedding Supper of the Lamb, as found in Revelation 19, verses 6 through 9. This had been prophesied in Isaiah 25, verse 6, which says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And the banquet is for all peoples. This is also indicated in Revelation, which says that by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Um, and in Matthew, Jesus said, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, Jesus was giving us a little foreshadow of the messianic banquet that will take place forever uh, by his eating with Levi. Now, the, the uh, episode with Levi also demonstrates our need for God's grace and forgiveness. When Jesus said to the Pharisees uh, and the scribes in verse 17, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. It reflects another aspect of the gospel and the kingdom. Um, verses 1 through 12, the healing of the paralyzed man demonstrated that Jesus uh, alone has the authority to forgive people. Verse 17 reveals our need for his forgiveness. God is holy, just, righteous, and good. And because God is morally perfect, that is the standard to which he calls us. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so when Jesus is talking about, uh, he, uh, he didn't, uh, uh, the well do not need a physician, uh, but the sick do. I came not to call the righteous, but the uh, uh, sinners. He's actually saying, we are all sinners, or you are all sinners. Jesus alone was not. Because Romans makes clear uh, that all have fallen short of the uh, uh, righteousness of God. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The sickness of our sin is not some little minor ailment that will go away on its own. It is fatal. That's why Paul says uh, in Romans 6, uh, in Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Um, in short, 
Our problem is inside of us. It's in our heart. And the problem is we cannot change our heart on our own, no matter how hard we try. That's why Ezekiel 36 says that when we come to Christ, he will give us a new heart. He will take our hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Only God can do that through Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus said in verse 17, he, has, he came to call the sinners uh, to repentance. We cannot achieve right standing with God on our own. Christ has to take the initiative. Um, and so that is what he does. You see, the gospel and salvation is and only can be given by God to people as a gift of his grace. Salvation is and only can be received by people solely by their faith in Christ. As Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 say, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. Um, so, it's when we turn to Christ in faith, he not only takes our sin onto himself and pays the price for our sin that we should have paid, but he also imputes to us his righteousness so that we can stand before God. And that's what Jesus, in effect, was saying to the scribes and the Pharisees in verse 17. That's what he was demonstrating with Levi. Now, this leads us to consider the profound nature of truly being born again. Verse 14 tells us that as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, note again, it's Jesus is the one who sought Levi out and called him. Levi had not been seeking Jesus. And it's the same is true for everybody. The gospel is not about our quest to find God. It is about God's coming to earth and finding us. He is primary in salvation. He has to work in our heart. He has to call us. He has to change our heart, regenerate us. And then when we confess faith, it is we are responding to what he has already done in us. And that is exactly demonstrated by Jesus calling Levi, then Levi's getting up and following him. As Timothy Keller points out, religion, in other words, any other religion except Christianity, operates on the principle, I obey and therefore I am accepted by God. But the operating principle of the gospel is, I am accepted by God through what Christ has done, and therefore I obey. Now, the calling of Levi demonstrates this uh, perhaps better than most other cases, and it demonstrates the profound nature of what being born again really means. A lot of people say, I'm born again, or I've accepted Jesus into my heart, and now I'm born again. Are they really? Well, Levi demonstrates that, and that's why this episode, just like the healing of the paralytic, is so important. It shows us what the gospel is really like. And there are at least two reasons why this is so important. Uh, one writer points out, there was much at stake for Levi in accepting Jesus' challenge to follow me. Fishermen, like Peter and James and John, uh, and Andrew, could easily go back to fishing, as some of the disciples did, as Peter himself did after Jesus' crucifixion. But Levi could never return to his tax booth. He had forfeited his position and could never go back to working as a tax collector. Um, so the tax collector jobs were greatly sought after as a way to get rich quickly. Um, he gave that all up. And additionally, as we pointed out earlier, tax collectors were considered by the other Jews essentially to be traitors to Israel. By following Jesus, Levi would be leaving his government associates and his social relationships and would be attaching himself to a group of people who probably would have despised him. Um, and uh, he would be adopting a new life completely foreign to everything he had ever known or done. That is a tremendous 
step. Yet Levi took that step. And it's the same for us, because in one sense, we are all, quote, tax collectors and sinners, unquote. As we read from Romans, no one does good. No, not one. No one seeks after God. Um, we are all unrighteous. We are all sick. We all need Jesus. And that is why it, we need to understand the implications of the gospel. And it, it's interesting. I mean, Levi did. It's interesting that other tax collectors and sinners in the Bible also recognize this and demonstrate it. Look at Zacchaeus in Luke 19. Uh, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm having dinner at your house tonight. Zacchaeus uh, uh, went, Jesus came to his house, and the people, as was true with the scribes and Pharisees for Levi, it says in Luke that they grumbled uh, and said, he's gone to be a guest of a man who's a sinner. But Zacchaeus' response, just like Levi's, shows that he recognized the profound transformative nature of the gospel. Because the first thing he did, he said, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now, Jesus did not say to Zacchaeus, Now, Zacchaeus, you bring the full tithe into the storehouse. No, 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 he didn't say that. It was Zacchaeus who said, I'm going to give 400%. Uh, four, or, no, if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to give 400%, and I'm giving half my goods. Remember, the law of the tithe only called for 10%. And the law said if you defrauded somebody, you had to give back what you defrauded plus 20%. Zacchaeus said, no, that's not enough. He recognized his heart was changed and he demonstrated it with his generosity. It was from the inside out. He was not just being put under the law of Moses, the law of the tithe. He had money and he knew that 10% was not enough. And that's why he said, I'm giving half to the poor. And if I've defrauded anybody, I'm giving back fourfold, not 120%. Um, and a similar example is found, tax collectors and sinners, in Luke 7, where a woman of the city who was a sinner, she brought an alabaster, uh, alabaster flask with ointment, and standing behind Jesus, uh, she uh, was weeping and began to wet his feet with uh, her tears and wiping them with her hair and kissing and anointing them with the ointment. Now, Jesus was at the home of Simon the Pharisee, and she just like the people in Zacchaeus's case, just like the scribes and Pharisees in Levi's case, said, you know, she's a sinner. And Jesus told Simon, he said uh, a parable and then said, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. You see, that woman knew the profound nature of being born again. It affects everything. Um, and so look at, she went to a Pharisee's house, knowing how he felt about her. She was humbled and embarrassed. She humbled and embarrassed herself by kissing Jesus's feet and wiping uh, them with her hair and giving up the costly uh, perfume. Um, and again, we see this contrast between those who recognize the sin in them. Uh, the example were to a tax collector. And a Pharisee went to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee basically uh, was exalting himself. I fast twice a week. I do this. And I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other people, like that tax collector. But the tax collector couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, Christianity is not a religion that uh, allows us to make ourselves acceptable to God. If you think that you've done something and now you're good enough for God, you've missed him. No, we need to understand that Christianity is a relationship with God whose heart is drawn to the sinful, the broken, the outcast, and the excluded. We need to recognize that there is nothing good in us uh, and that it is his work by his grace alone that saves us. And this leads to the fourth important aspect of the event with Levi, 
namely the nature of Jesus' opponents. In verse 16, it tells us, The scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Um, now, Jesus' eating with Levi and his friends showed Jesus' heart and Jesus' values. The scribes complaining revealed their attitude, their values, and their priorities. But, you see, that attitude is basically the attitude of the world. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And one problem is, the attitude of the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious people, the righteous people, is true just as much today as it was in Jesus' day. Um, because, you see, they, people who are self-righteous, who obey the rules, and so on and so forth, we tend to look down on the, quote, sinners, in quote. They're not good enough. Um, and, of course, nobody's good enough for crying out loud. We're not good enough. Um, but it, it's, it's deeper than simply a problem of favoring people who are like ourselves. It's an attitude to which everybody is uh, prone. Namely, it's the attitude that says, I've obeyed the rules. You should too. I've worked hard and made something of myself. And you should too. I've gone to church and paid my tithes. So God should bless me. But you, in, in your condition, it's your own fault. You have no one to blame but yourself. So don't come to me for help. In essence, self-righteous people who obey the rules are saying, they might not articulate this, but their attitude is, God, you owe me. I followed the rules. It's very much like in the parable, what's called the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. There, the father had two sons. The prodigal son, which most sermons concentrate on, is the guy who broke all the rules, went off, took his inheritance, spent it on, tax, on uh, prostitutes and so on, and then finally came home. But he, the older son was the one who stayed home. He followed the rules. He obeyed them. And, uh, and it's interesting. At the beginning of Luke 15, those two sons, uh, Jesus was talking to two groups of people, it says, in Luke 15, 1 and 2. He was talking to tax collectors and sinners and to Pharisees and the scribes. The tax collectors and sinners are represented by the younger son. The Pharisees and scribes are represented by the older brother. But in that parable, um, Remember, it was that the younger brother came home. They killed the fatted calf. They had a big party. Um, the older brother heard of it and refused to go in. Why? Because he it's ironic. At the end of the day, at the end of that parable, it was the younger son who was saved, who was participating in the messianic banquet. The older son excluded himself. He was not. Why? Because of his pride. It, because he looked down on his younger brother. He had never gone to try to find the younger brother and save him. No. He took pride in, I have obeyed the rules, and therefore, Father, you owe me. Um, and you see, that parable is telling us, and the attitude of the scribes in the episode with Levi tells us, there are two ways to be far from God. Number one, break all the rules. Do all the bad things. But secondly, you can be just as far from God and even further by obeying the rules because that makes you think that God owes you. That uh, uh, basically says that uh, I deserve to be saved. Um, the, and that's the attitude of the older brother. He excluded himself from the Messianic banquet, because he felt superior to his younger brother. And this is important for us in the churches, and I will conclude with this, because, yes, there are a few former prostitutes, uh, murderers, drunkards, drug addicts in the church, but not many. Most people in the churches are 
basically decent, respectable people. There are more older brothers in the churches, more scribes and Pharisees, than there are tax collectors and sinners. And they tend to have, or they may have, this attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, they don't see their need, that they are in the same boat spiritually as the tax collectors and sinners. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 21, we need to hear Christ's warning here, and with this I conclude, when he said, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you, you righteous people. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. We need to look at ourselves, our own attitudes, particularly if we have followed the rules, done things the right way. Look for that attitude of self-righteousness and realize, spiritually speaking, we have been just as far from God as the tax collectors and the sinners.